Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. We're just waiting for all of our attendees to arrive and we'll be starting shortly. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for joining us over the noon hour. I'm Denise Vigno with Howard Center. We want to welcome everyone to our third session in our weekly speaker series as we continue our recognition of world mental health all throughout October. And while we certainly wish we could be together in person, it's been so nice to have these sessions as another way to stay connected. World Mental Health Day was earlier this month on 10 10 20, and we're taking the opportunity to raise awareness by sharing community resources like this speaker series, all in the spirit of this year's global movement, which is about ensuring access to mental health supports for everyone, no matter where they are in the world. And certainly ensuring access to care is critical to the work we do at Howard Center and especially relevant in the midst of COVID-19. We're very much looking forward to hearing our panel talk about educating, parenting, managing stress and family resilience in just a few minutes. But before we get started, we wanna say thank you to our sponsors for their support. Our champion sponsors, Hannaford and Seventh Generation, our advocates, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and Marsh and McLennan, our supporters, Ben and Jerry's and Burton, our allies, Invest EAP and Timberlane Dental, and a special thanks to our friends at Seventh Generation for their many months of support and planning. We do have a few housekeeping notes to review. During the webinar, our attendees' audio, video, and chat will not be available, but the Q&A will be available throughout uh, the presentation. And you may ask questions all throughout the webinar using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Your questions may be asked anonymously and all attendees will be able to see uh, one another's questions. We'll also be recording today's webinar and we'll make it available in the coming days at howardcenter.org. And now I'd like to welcome our panelists, Kara Gleason Krebs from Howard Center, LeVar Barino from Burlington High School, Tim Weil from Champlain Valley Union High School, and Dr. Faiza Bashalu, also from Howard Center. I'll turn it over to you now, Kara. Kara is our Director of School Services and has been incredibly, incredibly helpful in planning uh, this talk today. So thank you very much. Welcome everyone. Thanks, Denise. Hi everyone. As she said, I'm Kara Gleason Krebs and I'm the Director of Howard Center School Services Program, which is a program that has embedded mental health clinicians or social workers in schools in every district in the county. And I'm so excited to be here today with LaVar and Tim and Faiza because they really love and respect kids and their families and they all bring a strong sense of community to every interaction, which is so helpful right now. And we're here, we're here to talk about parenting and facilitating our kids' education. And our hope is to share some ideas and tools to help you stay compassionate for yourselves and everyone around you. The plan is that I'll share some simple frameworks and strategies for you to use to gain a sense of control. And then I'll pass it to LaVar and Tim who will go a bit deeper into some concepts and skills around how to build connection. Faisal will talk about the mental health of people across the age span and what's typical in this time and when and how to reach out for more specific help. We wanna build connection by talking about our shared experiences while also deeply respecting that we are not all impacted in the same way. We sit in this moment with vast differences in resources and privilege and struggles and our own personal circumstances. Please know that we are starting from the strong belief that we are all doing the best we can. Our kids, your kids, families and communities all have valuable perspectives and incredible strengths that we wanna help build upon. We may know you, it's a small community, we may not. And even though we can't see you, we're so glad you're here. We hope that you'll ask questions and share your thoughts with us and we will definitely leave time for that towards the end. But before we start, we thought it would be good to hear from the kids.
I'm not hearing the audio on the slide. Are, is it working? Okay. Looks like Brittany's trying again to get the audio working on the slide. And we're not hearing it right now. Well, we take a moment. Um, hopefully things are going in the schools and in everybody's day. And Brittany's working hard. To get the audio back going. So maybe we should move past it for now and see if we can go back to it. Would that make sense? It occurs to me this is a great uh, mm -hmm. chance to reflect on the role that technology has been playing in our <laughs> lives. And how and sometimes in schooling. <laughs> in schooling, absolutely, and how sometimes this is a real challenge. Uh, this is as students do remote learning. This is a challenge that they uh, face all the time. And yes, Allison, it's true. We have to adapt and keep moving. <laughs> So maybe I should just talk it, start talking about um, toxic stress. So <laughs> hopefully we'll have the videos come back. We have some great thoughts by kids um, who shared with us what it feels like to be a kid in this time. But I'm gonna start by sharing two concepts to view what's been happening to our emotional health over the past seven months. And the first is toxic stress. And this stems from the ACEs study that was, which showed long-term impacts of stress on both our mental and physical health. And this makes so much sense, right? We all know what it feels like in the moment when we feel stress in our body, when the technology doesn't work, right? Racing heart rate, butterflies in the stomach, red face, sweaty pits. So if you think about being in that aroused state over time, of course, it's gonna have impact on all of our systems and cause harm. And even though each of us are experiencing this at a different time and different ways, we all right now have conflicting pressures and so much information flooding our brains. It's really overwhelming. I'm sure if I could ask you right now, most of you would easily be able to share the physical impacts of COVID and stress on your body. You could even probably tell me where you're feeling the stress in your body right now. There is hope though, right? This chart is a nice representation of the spectrum of stress. Not all stress is bad. In fact, sometimes it's beneficial and protective and create, can it create opportunity and growth. When we move through a stressful time, we learn about how strong and resilient we are. And when stress does become too much, there are things we can do to move back into that tolerable or even positive place. You can see here that studies have shown that the key aspect to protecting against the impacts of toxic stress on children is the presence of a caring and buffering adult. And I'd say this is not just for kids, right? Adults can be the buffering and caring adult from each other. We all need each other. And when we put strategies in place, we can even be the buffer for ourselves. Can we move to the next slide? So the second framework I just wanna talk a little bit about is grief. We heard, well, we didn't hear in the video, but you might have heard the kids talk about things that they've lost and that they're grieving during, during the pandemic. And as adults, we all feel losses too. This image here is about the stages of grief. This is an old concept from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross back in the 70s. And there's been lots of adaptions and critiques of it over the years. Of course, all cultures grieve in different ways. 
but it's persisted because of two key concepts that often ring true for many of us. Grief is sneaky, right? It shows up in different ways. Sometimes it shows up as anger, other times as feelings of anxiety or exhaustion. And grief is also dynamic, it changes. It's not the same every day or every time we deal with something hard. And sometimes it even pops back up when we least expect it. So with this in mind, during this time when there's so much to grieve, when you feel strong emotions, a wave of anger or sadness comes over you or anxiety makes it hard to sleep at night, it can be really helpful to scratch beneath the surface and ask, what am I grieving? Or when someone else is having a big reaction at you, your child is having a tantrum or withdrawing, someone in your life is becoming very rigid and controlling, it can be helpful to just consider what's underneath this. What are they grieving? Are they grieving the loss of feeling competent at things they used to feel like they were good at? Are they grieving the loss of feeling safe or normal in places that used to be where they really found a lot of joy? Recognizing this grief doesn't change what's ever happening in the moment, of course, but it helps you understand it, right? It helps you have a little bit more control and hopefully feel a little bit more compassionate towards yourself and others. Can we go to the next slide? Oops, we missed one. There you go. <laughs> so knowing that some days we're stressed and some days we're grieving, what, we can, what can we do to build resilience in our families? We can work to stay grounded and connected. So if you search for images of grounded and connected on the internet, as I have, this is what pops up. And I'm a social worker and not an engineer, but I know enough to know that this is an electrical circuit and was not what I was looking for. But after thinking about it for a little while, the analogy makes some sense to me. This is the way that we harness energy to create electricity to move us forward, right? It requires connection and grounding and a power source to make it go all the parts need to be connected and working together. And this idea works either way, right? Whether the energy is sort of wild and you're crazy right now and feels out of control or whether it's really low and stuck, strategically working to be grounded and connected will help you harness that energy and move your family forward. One more slide. So how do we get grounded? I'm gonna talk about getting grounded and then leave it to LaVar and Tim to talk more about getting connected. Getting grounded, coming back into ourselves can help us feel a sense of control. It helps us focus on the positive and allows us to see what we need for support. And there's lots of different ways to do this. The first is in your body. And this can be both a prevention and an intervention technique. Grounding for prevention is when we think about healthy habits and self-care. And it's so important for all the members of your family to find ways to get moving. And this will be different for different families. For some families, maybe you do things all together. You walk the dog, you do yoga, you find ways to connect around grounding. And for other families, this might mean giving each other the time and space that you need to take care of yourselves on your own. Either way, working together to make it happen is what's needed. Grounding is also an intervention. And this is so important because while self-care is wonderful and important, the truth is that right now there's really no amount of yoga that's gonna get most of us through this without having times when we're just frustrated and emotional and out of control and overwhelmed. And that's okay because your kids don't need you to be the most serene, organized caregiver all the time. What they really need to do is see you have moments where you're feeling emotional and overwhelmed and then see you be able to regroup, calm back down, recover, work with them and figure out what to do next. And in order to do this, most of us need grounding techniques. We need to know what makes us feel calm so that we can do it in the moment. And so it's so important that everybody in the family knows what works for them and that you know what works for each other so you can help remind each other to do it. And there's so many different ways, right? Music, a walk, breathing, mindfulness, crumpling paper, lots of different things. We can also find ways to get grounded in our days. And this is about rebuilding routines and rituals, taking control over what's happening after the pandemic sort of threw us all off track. And so again, for different families, this is different. Maybe in a family where there's older kids, this is about family meetings on Monday and Thursday night to talk about what schoolwork's gotten done and what else needs to happen. For a family with younger kids, maybe it's about bedtime routines and morning checklists and making sure what needs to get done. And this can also be about thinking about how to give kids more responsibility and independence so that it shares the load of the work of the household and they really feel important and like useful members of your family. And the last one is 
getting grounded in your heart and mind. And this is about really getting clear with yourself and your family about what's important to you right now. Not last year, not next year. What's important? What's most important for you right now? And what's most important for you and not everybody else? Because when we're feeling stressed and overwhelmed, it's so easy to feel outside pressures and to compare ourselves to others. So if you always have your touchstones to go back to amongst your family where you know the bottom line is what's most important to you, it can really help you move through this in a really positive way. So that was everything that I had to talk about. And now I'm gonna pass it to LeVar. We had hoped to show you some more videos and maybe we'll get to do that at the end. Kara, thank you. What a great transition. Uh, again, my name is LeVar Barino. I am the Student Achievement Advisor here at Burlington High School. Uh, this is my third year. Uh, the main goal of my role is really to, uh, to close down the achievement gap uh, that is brought by all students here at the school of their struggles, especially dealing with COVID and remote learning. Uh, number one of my strength is really building positive relationships with students and families in my 17 years of service within this community um, through a nonprofit, which speaks about the good work that we've been doing. And I'm gonna let you guys in a light of some of the things that has been going on since we've been out of school in March uh, what does the outreach look like? What does connecting with families look like? What does connecting with kids look like? Also, what are those natural supports? Um, and also utilizing some form of restorative, restorative practices um, into kids and families daily routine. So I remember, you know, March came, I'm in BHS with about 18 kids. You know, uh, the first thing I thought about is, wow, what type of outreach and support can I do with my team in order to support students and families knowing that they're not gonna be coming to schools, they're gonna to have to engage in some type of remote learning, which is gonna be challenging as we see with technology, with audio, with number of family members that they have in the house. Um, all that comes to tuition of how kids can learn. We send kids to school for a reason. You know, This is a, a place for them to get Wi-Fi, to get food, social interaction, build positive peer relationship, but also connecting with trusted adults. I'm happy to say that I'm one of those trusted adults here in the school and out there in the community. Some of the things that we did to connect with families once we knew COVID hit, instead of disappearing, you know, we partnered up with the food distribution, the property services, where we were able to link up with them and be seen and really see families who need to come and get food to really connect with them there. And as we connected, we built such a great unity team. We had a representative from student support, RSO officer, um, social work, food property, and guidance. You know, all people who normally in the midst of us disappearing and not being present were able to meet people where they're at and really engage and be seen and give them advice and check in because that's what most families want. COVID is hard. This time is hard. It's challenging. Um, connecting with kids, social and emotional support. You know, one of my roles here is really to connect with kids via email to say, hey, how are you, first of all? How are you doing? What are your needs? And then expressing, looking at their grades, jumping into attendance, and then talking about engagement. Again, COVID is hard. There's no rules to this. We're going along making this. As we go along, we're making this up. We're creating, we're being more flexible as more remote we are, the more we're looking at different ways of how to better support our students and families. Um, find a connection during this time where we're, when we're actively trying to stay apart, it's hard. Uh, we have Wednesdays as you know, a, a no service day where kids are, can check in for time with their teachers uh, for callback, but we utilize those Wednesdays to have PEs, to do walking groups, to engage in community service to create infinity groups. Again, we want kids to see other peers. They went months without seeing no one for months. So how do we reincorporate that back into a daily norm? What makes sense? We're all trying to make sense of this. So through that, we're trying to utilize restorative practice. How do we do restorative practice when we cannot meet in person, sit in circles and share the same talking piece? So we went with our restorative practice team and created a virtual restorative practice. So now we can do this online 
to law enforcement kids to give them a talking piece to talk about their concerns, their angst, you know, what's going on in their life. Those are things we're doing here in the school, in the school district to support our students and families. We know that parents and caregivers may think and expect more of them at, at this case, but I wanna clarify that we don't expect a six hour home day or perhaps offer an estimate of how much time you would like to work, you know, split it up into chunks, encourage feedback and communication so we can help and adjust as things move forward. Um, we wanna let parents know that, that they're doing their best that they can and that it's okay to call it for the day. You know, if, if, if you run against a wall, again, you don't wanna add more stress to your household or to your kid because we're already in a stressful situation. Um, parents and caregivers with multiple children appear overwhelmed by information. Uh, and what I'm relaying to them is perhaps develop a small group of consultants in each school that will help parents look at the schoolwork for multiple children in one family and define a realistic plan. We know that families receive a lot of communication from several people and some are overlapping. It's just too much. As we move forward, can we define roles? Transparency and honesty has been really helpful in sustaining trust. When offering support to students, focus on listening and validating their experience. By doing that, you're gonna get the best from your student, you're gonna get the best from the parent. This work is gonna take all of us as a whole, community, teachers, parents, RSO officers, to make the best work for all of these students moving forward to reassure that when we do eventually bounce back and we are gonna bounce back, that all these kids and parents are ready to be successful moving forward and have that charge and have that energy. And I'm glad to say that I'm here to help be a part, to lead part of that charge, if not some here at the BHS and within the Burlington community. I'm gonna pass it on to my friend, Tim. Thanks, LeVar. Uh, so, hey, my name is Tim Weil, and uh, as you heard, I am the lead counselor at CBU. Um, and to give you a little background, um, I spent the last two years as the in interim director of school counseling at BHS, where I got to work with LeVar, who, by the way, is amazing. And before that, spent 20 years as a school counselor, most of the time at, as director at South Burlington High School. Uh, going back further, I spent 15 years in private practice in Burlington, uh, my practice primarily focusing on young people with learning differences. And prior to that, going way back, I spent a couple of years working at Pine Ridge School in Williston, Vermont. Uh, Pine Ridge was a boarding school for students with learning with significant learning disabilities. Um, so as, as I talk, I want to go touch on some of the things that Karen and LeVar spoke about in terms of buffering adults, in terms of rituals, in terms of uh, trusted adults and building connections, because those themes I think um, follow through on all of our work. But to go back to my experience at Pine Ridge, one of the things I learned early on at Pine Ridge was the incredible value of belonging. Most of the students there arrived after years of struggling in school, often feeling like an outsider, like they didn't belong. One of the most healing aspects of the school was the developing sense that they did belong, that they had something to offer to the people around them, that they were valuable and valued. This was truly life-changing for many of these students. And it's this, the idea of belonging that I wanna talk more about today. Belonging is the feeling of being part of something, of feeling connected and valued. It creates in each of us a critical sense that we have worth, that we are worth being part of something. And this is incredibly important because it's a fundamental part of who we are as human beings. But I wanna start by inviting you to reflect a bit, bit on your sense of belonging. Who are your people? How do you identify? Do you identify as part of a family? Do you identify as part of a church community? As part of a team at a job? As a parent sharing responsibility for your children? 
as a hockey player in a league or as a community gardener or as a member of a book club? Where have you felt a sense of belonging? I invite you too to think about the meaning these identities have brought to you, to the sense of community and value you may have experienced as a result of these connections. How has your sense of self and value been impacted by this sense of belonging to a community? And I wonder too, what is the sense of loss you may have experienced as a result of COVID? How have your connections been disrupted? And how might this have affected your sense of who you are and how you belong? For many of us as adults, these connections and identities are longstanding and will likely withstand the disruption and isolation of COVID. We have hopefully developed a strong sense of self and a solid sense of our worth. And for young people, this sense of identity can certainly be more of a challenge. Yeah, certain connections likely remain with family and perhaps with friends we're able to see. And for many young people, these identities, this sense of belonging can prove less durable. Young people are in the process of building identity. This is their developmental task. These identities can be more fleeting and pliable as they try out new activities and create new friendships. For some, their group was who they sat with on the bus or who they played with on the playground or who they played on a sports team with or with whom they acted in a play. They were in the process of finding their people. Many of these connections quite appropriately expanded from home to school and friends and community. And then along came COVID. In March, most of us retreated to our homes as the world seemed a dangerous place. Going grocery shopping seemed perilous and many went so far as to wipe down their groceries and shop at off hours. Relationships and habits and rituals were suddenly disrupted. Certainly as time progressed and we got more information, we felt freer to expand our lives and yet still we have sought to be careful. We limited our contact to be sure we did not expose the vulnerable. And while summer allowed us more time outside to engage in activities that allowed for physical distancing, we have continued to exercise appropriate caution. And as fall approached and schools reopened, I think many of us had hoped schools would once again provide opportunities for connection and new opportunities for belonging. And while schools are working hard to make their buildings feel inclusive, the required safety precautions mean that the schools we came back to are not entirely the schools we left. Six foot distancing in the classrooms, wearing masks, little freedom for spontaneous interactions means a much more controlled and rigid environment. The opportunities to develop a sense of belonging are diminished and for some feel like a paltry version of what they once were. And for many students across the state, their learning has moved fully remote as they stay home to protect themselves and vulnerable family members. Uh, so what do we do as parents? Well, first we listen. As LeVar commented, we make time to hear our children's experiences and acknowledge they are real even when they might be hard for us to understand, even when they might seem dramatic or over the top. The loss and disappointment that our kids are feeling are real. And second, we're called upon to create new opportunities for connection and belonging in very intentional ways. How do we create shared moments, new patterns and rituals out of which a sense of belonging may emerge in talking with some of my students who are fully remote in their learning, I've asked them what helps to sustain them. They talk of a family game night, a daily family walk or weekly hike, a regular movie night, or Wednesdays of making dinner together. In each of these instances, students reported feeling connected and comforted. There really are endless opportunities. And as you learn more about what your child might miss 
you can be endlessly creative. Missing grandma who's too vulnerable to visit? Maybe it's a weekly family call to her. Is it gaming with friends a child is missing? Maybe it's time to take a lesson from your child about how to play and a chance to let them be the expert. And what is important to remember is that the first times of creating these rituals and patterns, there may be resistance and awkwardness, uh, as there often is with any new experience. Make it fun, be flexible and creative. Invite many voices, voices to be heard so the experience reflects everyone. The goal is to create these opportunities to find correct connection, to be part of something. We can often think in regular times that the school age years are the time for our children to differentiate, to become their own people separate from us as parents. And indeed, this is still true. And we can support this process by being curious and respectful of their thinking and feelings, of hanging in there with them a little longer, and in appreciating the increasingly expanding person they are becoming. And in the end, we might find we know them better and enjoy them more than we otherwise would have. So that's my thoughts and I'm gonna pass it on to Faiza. Hi everyone, and thank you, Kara, Lavar, and Tim. Great, great thoughts to chew on. Um, I learned myself from every word you said. I'm Faiza Boshola. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist that sees clients at Howard Center as well as counseling services of Edison County down in Middlebury. And I also do um, some teaching work for University of Vermont, which is my side passion other than children. Um, I was asked to talk about um, when we were juggling through all this experience and our children are in this with us. When do we get concerned about something is beyond my capacity to give a hand to my child and I need to reach out for support? And how do I know that's time for that? So um, I think I'm going to look at it from the other side. Instead of focusing on what's mental health concern and mental illness, I will define what mental wellness is. So you can have a perspective on, okay, my child is failing to do that. So the definition of mental wellness is that we can have that state of well-being in a way that we can do three things. And those are the three buzzwords that I'm gonna keep saying, that we can think well, and then we can act well, and then we can feel well, right? And then we break down that information into age appropriate information. What does it mean for a three-year-old to think, act and feel well, right? All three-year-olds throw tantrums and they wanna do it all. And then what does that mean for a 17-year-old who says, get out of my room, I need privacy. I'm trying to figure out my life. I want independence, get out of my room. Is that a concern or not? So. As we, and you, moms and dads, are the experts on your children, right? As you look at your child and see that they are not thinking the way they used to, or acting or feeling the way they used to, again, the key word is something out of their norm. He's off. She's not acting like herself. Those are the buzzwords that we need to look at. And again, what I'm gonna quote here is, and that's gonna echo all um, thoughts from three of my friends, but Joelle Van Lent, which I respect so deep, deeply, um, is a clinician in Chittenden County, puts this as, we're all in the same boat, does not apply to COVID. She says, we're all in the same storm, but your boat is different than my boat, than my 17 year olds, than Tim's, than we're all, in the same storm and how it applies to us, to our boats could be different. So you approach your child to see, is he or she just acting off, feeling off, and then thinking off is when you start ringing those bells to, to look for help. Um, so what does thinking off could look like at times of COVID? 
worrying a lot, right? Making, making lots of worries, that really doesn't make sense. And worries don't have any rationale, but doesn't make sense in the moment. I'm gonna choke if I wear a mask. No, you won't, but no, you won't, or saying, no, you won't choke, deal with it, doesn't help, right? As uh, all my friends said, these ears are the best tools. So listening and validating and understanding the worry and digging deeper. And the fear may look like seeking reassurance, constantly asking for questions, being more clingy, being more restless, being more disruptive in their classroom. You know, the, the thinking not well can look like acting not well. And then somebody needs to look into what's going on for them to understand that the acting not well looks like. They may start getting into trouble all of a sudden. They may start whining. They may start just being irritable and grumpy for no good reason. And not like the 17 year old that I was talking about, which is normative, but your sweet and cute 17 year old is all of a sudden acting grumpy and overwhelmed. That's a signal. Um, unable to focus, not being able to be on task despite all the support that's being offered. Um, big reactions to little things, big emotions coming up, being maybe stubborn. For little ones, maybe regressing a few years, all of a sudden bedwetting or nightmares. Those could be all little subtle signs of um, distress. And then one level up, of course, would be really feeling sad and down and clinically, not COVID appropriate, but clinically worried to a point that they cannot function anymore. So those are all good signs to look for. So one, they are not acting, feeling, or thinking right. They're not like themselves. And all the, all the skills that I can provide, meaning I'm listening, I'm validating, I'm connecting, I have my family movie nights, I'm cooking with all the things that LeVar, Tim, and Kara talked about, it's not helping. And I'm, my child is not bouncing back. And I'm seeing signs that what Kara mentioned, appropriate dose of stress, which will make them stronger, is now turning into a toxic level of stress and they are not coping well. And that's when you seek for help. And of course, the storm doesn't apply to only our child. We're all stressed ourselves as parents. And then while I monitor for all these changes and ask for help, how do I model calmness? And even if there's a storm inside of us, how do we put ourselves out there to provide calmness and reassurance to the child while getting help. And that can be hard. We all have been round the clock caregivers and teachers, right? Some of us experience financial insecurity, health fears, getting the virus ourselves, our love. I mean, we're all stressed out. So while we're taking care of little munchkins, how do we model calmness to them and monitor for getting help? So if we decide that, okay, it's time to get help, this is exceeding my capacity to get help for my child, the best way to start is really, if you already have a team, you just resort back to them. You may already have a therapist, a guidance counselor, or everybody has a pediatrician, right? The person or the providers that are already in your circle is the first door to knock. But if you find yourself that you're in acute, like literally within the hour, acute crisis, then Howard Center with First Call for Chittenden County for 887777 is 24-7 right there for you. Um, that's for acute crisis. But for in the big picture, you're seeing your child declining. Again, your existing people um, start if it's a school problem, your guidance counselors or school-based therapists, if you have one, or your pediatrician, pediatric offices have their medical social workers that can connect you with folks. That's the first door to knock. And then um, if you go, if you can just dial this on your phone, 211, but if you go on Google, um, vermont211.org is a great resource. And that's not only about um, finding a mental health provider, but this, the, sometimes going to the root of the stress can be a good thing to think about. And the basics could be as simple as I need food, I need Wi-Fi, I need a computer, I need my basic things to be met, and then all of, I need legal aid. I don't feel safe because I have a domestic violence person in my house and I don't even know where to start. Basics are important and 211 
or vermont211.org could be a great resource in accessing not only mental health um, help, but also basic needs as well. Um, I would also encourage you to learn more about Vermont Family Network. They do have great resources to support you in whichever way you may need. It could be as simple as I'm about to go in an educational meeting for my child because the remote learning, work, learning is not working for me. I don't even know what to say in that meeting. It's intimidating. Vermont Family Network can provide that support for you. We also, as Howard Center, do help you find mental health providers, and that's Partners for Access. Um, and um, Kara, I, I will need your help here. I think we do have a number for that, and we can get to that during the Q&A. But if you feel like I'm starting from scratch and I need um, to find a provider, Howard Center would be able to help you access services as well. So those are my thoughts quickly. We really want to save time for Q&As to be able to hear what you have to ask us. And that's, I believe, the time for that, unless the videos are ready. Thank you so much, Faiza and Tim and LeVar. That was amazing. And we are going to try the videos one more time. So let's see if it will work, because it will be so great to hear from the kids. Okay, that doesn't seem like it's working right now, but we do have some great questions. And the first one was, how do I balance explaining to my child the seriousness of COVID-19 without creating anxiety? Does anyone want to take that one? LaVar's going for it. Yeah, All right. yeah I will. Um, like I said, I mean, I have younger kids at home as well. I mean, my youngest is now 14. Um, I can only imagine talking to the students in my K-5 program about this, but it's about educate, educating them without giving them angst. And by that meaning, just have an honest, real conversation about you know what's going on, about mask wearing, about the effects of what you can get because it's, it's, it's real. You just gotta keep the conversation as real as you can. I mean, you know your child, all your parents out there are experts at your own child. You guys know your children better than anybody out there. You know how much information that you can share without causing angst, but you also should know how much information you can share that's gonna cause the anxiousness of your child. If not, I say just give your child as much information that you feel comfortable with yourself as a parent. And then that will open up the gate if you need to talk a little bit more in depth or provide some more clarity or bring in somebody that supports you in the school to just have that conversation wrapped around, whether it's the child's teacher, um, a family friend, um, somebody in the neighborhood, but make that connection because you're not alone. And anything you can do to pair the information about COVID and how serious it is with exactly what they can do to keep themselves safe so that they're in control and empower them to remind their adults in their lives and the other kids in their lives they can really start to feel a sense of, yes, there are things beyond our control, but I can always keep myself safe. So the next question that we have is, I have experienced kids preferring online learning, one specifically experiencing ongoing anxiety related to kids who've been mean in the classroom. How will we support kids who may be benefiting, better focus, less stress expressed from the new way? I have a quick thought. I mean, we all have learned so much from this, right? Whatever is working well amongst COVID, I really hope we do continue to take forward as things evolve and change. So hopefully we'll be able to provide all kinds of opportunities for kids to access what's working really well, the things that we learned during this time. Did anyone else wanna to add to that response? Um, well, I'm, I'm I'm a little confused by the question because I, it sounds like there are students who indeed think this is great. Like they are really happy that they get to be home and work remotely and that we have devised school, a, a system really that supports them in doing that. Um, I, I guess the, the thing that I think about is in terms of when 
those opportunities diminish because hopefully we will get back to be able to go back to school full time for all students. I think the work will lie in how do we help those students seek the resources and supports they need to feel like school, regular school can be safe. School should never be unsafe because of bullying or harassment. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we as schools are working really hard to address those. And so working with support people at schools to ease that transition back, I think it's gonna be really important. I just wanted to add that if the remote learning feels great to the child because it's enabling a certain struggle, for example, I have awful social anxiety. I don't need to see anyone. The moment I give my attendee as plus check, Johnny is here. I can be good to go, close my screen and do my work in my own pace. That's a little bit concerning because if we don't expose ourselves to our fears in a therapeutic way, then it will only get worse and re-entry will be pretty difficult. But if a child is loving that because there is one-on-one -on -one attention from mom, you know, being the secretary of the mind and doing all the scheduling for the kid, that should be used for the child as information to how to move on. Okay, this worked well because, okay, you needed this level of learning or support, then that could be a positive thing. I think as long as it's not great because it's enabling something that we need to be working on, it can turn in, be turned into helpful information in, turn, in terms of the child's learning style. Thank you all. I have children in grades one and four and between school and occupying them while I am working, they are getting a lot of screen time. What can I do to minimize any negative effects of spending more time in front of the screen? Do you want me to take away initial thoughts? Sure. So first of all, I think, I think this was everybody's adult anxiety in terms of how are we going to handle screen time when it was already difficult. Um, so a couple of studies actually, one of them came from UCLA, that during COVID, the screen time that the kids were allowed to do didn't actually impact necessarily their quality family time and learning more than what it was before COVID. So if a child had unhealthy screen habits before COVID, they continue to have so, maybe the parents are seeing it more, and the, the kids who were responsible to bring that balance continued to do so. The second study came through NIH, um, and that said that, first of all, we need to be flexible. Friendships are crucial. If the screen time is being used to connect with a friend, let it be. But the bottom line of the study was it's not necessarily about time or hours on the screen. And during COVID, it, it may not be as awful as it sounds like. One, if it's not interfering with their sleep and functioning. Two, if what they're doing on the screen is something reasonable. If they're doing a math game, let it be. If they're FaceTiming with a friend and playing, I don't know, headbands, let it be that those are all great things to keep them connected and cheerful. But if they're spending four hours on Fortnite, that may be a problem. So the bottom line is we have to be flexible as parents. We have to accept the fact that it's not the good old days that we were raised in. Screen time is a reality. And then it may not be as awful as we fear as long as what they're doing on the screen is something good and helpful. Did you want to add to that, Lavar? She covered it. That was well said. So the next question, and maybe you answered it a little bit um, as well, Faiza, is I'm nervous to allow my children to play with their friends as I'm not sure how careful their families are. What are some creative ideas that I can promote socialization with peers without increasing risk to my family? And I think you really said it. There are some great ways that kids can connect over the technology. Did you want to add to that, LeVar? Uh, yeah, I, as far as, again, uh, you know, again, you can use technology to, to see your friend, you know, even though, again, they're doing work all day and morning till two, and then they're jumping on Roblox and Fortnite, and then you want them to talk to their friends so I can understand, like, all this is screen, 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 but to provide safety, you know, that is one way, one outlet that you can connect like I was saying, as far as like we create um, restorative circles. 
for people who have not had a chance to see their peers virtually, where we could do that and have group discussions and kind of like what we're doing in Zoom, where they can see their friends and talk and engage in a safe manner that's comfortable to both the kid and the families. Um, so that way there's no uh, division. Any advice to help develop time management and prioritization skills in young kids? My son is in second grade. Getting homework done on remote days takes way longer than needed. I'll jump on the time management piece. Uh, you know, I went to private school. Uh, I did two hours of time management. You'd be amazed at how much you could get done in a matter of two hours. So I guess just pick and choose what two hours you want to get things done and, and go from there. I will at least start with that. Tim or Faisa, would you like to add anything? I just want to say that uh, it's a universal fact, no matter what culture or what country or what age it is, is that kids respond to humor and rewards. So instead of focusing on how am I going to schedule the day, uh, and that's needed, and visuals help, consistency helps. If we know that this is what Monday will look like, this is what Tuesday will look like after school, if those are in-person days. And Wednesday, fine, I'll give you a break for a half a day, but these are your responsibilities. And then this is how we're going to catch up. And this is what every single week will look like. Repetition helps think in skills and habits, right? And please stick that on the wall, make a giant fun poster and stick it on the wall for the sake of consistency. But then to implement it is where the struggle comes from, is what I'm hearing from the question. They do respond to humor and reward. If they don't, then that's another signal to ask for more professional help. But if you say, I have a meeting on Zoom, you have an hour, I have an hour. If you can write me five sentences of writing for a first grader, let's say, we're going to regroup in the hallway. Whoever finished it will have, I don't know, we'll have five minutes of silly jumping jacks together with mom. They will do it, promise. But if you say, I'm stressed, you're stressed, this needs to be done, look at the poster, what did I tell you? We're not going to get anywhere. I feel like using a proper, and rewards not meaning material rewards, but fun time rewards and humor is the best strategy to go for a child who is at a developmentally expected stage though, if the child is struggling with clinical anxiety or has a learning disability or have attention problems, that may be a different story for you and that may be time to get professional help. But for a neurodevelopmental at age expectation place kind of a child, I would say consistency, repetition, humor, and rewards would be the key. And I will add that if you could see the videos, there were several videos of young people saying, I really like it when my parents make me a list. I really like when my parents are clear about what's work time and what's break time. Please give me reminders. So it might not be their response in the moment, but they're really asking for it in lots of different ways. Yeah, and I would just add, and first of all, um, Faiza, I think what you offered was absolutely right, that humor and consistency, consistency, consistency is really important. And I also makes me reflect on the miracles that are elementary school teachers who have 15 or 20 kids that they're trying to shepherd forward in a positive way. The only other things that I think I would just add would be um, the space that the child's in and whether it's a distracting space or whether it's a space that they know that when they go there, this is where I do school. Um, I think that can make an enormous difference. I think that's true even of older students. Um, lying on a bed to try to do your homework is not a particularly good plan. Um, so I, I think consistency space, uh, distractibility of the space, those also really can make a big difference. I think we're gonna take time for one last question. I'm seeing it sort of rolls into this. I have a 16 year old daughter who has difficulty getting work done, difficult with remote work and doesn't like to ask for help or talk about school with us, distracted by phone and friends. What are suggestions you have in terms of helping with support without her feeling like we're controlling her? I think one idea is to work collaboratively together, not in the moment of stress, to create a schedule and a plan. When are you going to check in with her? What can you agree about ways in which you can be helpful to her and stick to that so that you've come up with it together and you've shared this idea? 
Does anyone else have any suggestions? Uh, my, yeah, my suggestion would be a conversation about what is, it, what is the outcome your daughter wants? Um, some, sometimes the, the argument about the content of what you're gonna do in the moment is very dis different than what would you like the outcome to be and what help do you think you need to get that outcome and what role might we play in helping you to achieve that outcome? So that it's really what she wants. You're just there to assist her towards that goal. So we're gonna wrap it up. I know there was one question that we missed and we will be sure to follow up with an email to everyone around that question and any other questions that come up. And I think we could try, Denise, could we try after the time is over? I could try to share from my computer if anybody wants to stay, if they happen to have extra time to see if we can share the videos. So that would you're be, nodding at me. That's that would okay. Be, that would be great, Kara. Okay, so we'll try me, one last time. Do you wanna try to do it right now? I can try and do it right yeah, now. Let's, sure. let's try. Um, it's pretty stressful. Um, yeah, it's pretty stressful, but um, I think it's getting better. I just like. Zoom meetings are hard to get on, you know, to put a long story short, um, and just the fact that I can't interact with people face to face. That I am grateful for the fact that I can play like Among Us, Roblox, and Minecraft with friends. That is definitely a plus. I can't do what I want as much, and it's much more uncertain what I'll be able to do, which is really disappointing and hard. Um, also, sports seasons are shortened. Or not happening or altered, which makes it very difficult and, I don't know, sad. I miss playing with my friends. Okay, during COVID is kind of different because you have to keep your mask on during the school day. It's different from all the other school years. Um, it's kind of different because when you're going to a birthday party, you have to keep your mask on. My class only has 10 kids because of COVID. And all my friends got put on Monday, Tuesday, so it's definitely difficult with that. Um, we don't really like it because it's not really that fun. I feel very, 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 very confused. Um, well, what I think is hard is that, um, when you sometimes get back from, like, a road trip, you have to stay home. So that's kind of hard. Have a set and sewn schedule. You're kind of the student and the teacher. You have to be on top of all your work, or nobody else is. Uh, it's kind of fun because kind of you get to sit in your own spot and you get your own table. But it's also kind of fun. Well, currently, I'd say being a teenager during COVID has cost me the experience of being a senior or just a kid in general. It's my last year before college, and I'm missing out on all the little things that meant so much to me that I've been waiting for since freshman year. I'm missing my senior prom, getting ready for college is also way more challenging than I thought it would be, especially with COVID happening. I miss traveling the most and missing out on the experience of being a kid and not having to worry about getting me or others sick. So that was one of them. We do have two more that we can share after, but I know Denise, do you need to wrap things up and then we can share them if people want to stay? Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. that, that was really wonderful. And uh, Kara, Tim, Faiza and LeVar, it, it's so evident the passion that you have for the work you do and the students you work with. So thank you very much for your time and uh, really sorry about the tech problems. I'm glad we got to see that video. One of the things that Kara and her team in school services, the sentiment that they've been working with is please stay safe in all things except your imagination of how things could be better. You'll see that on the screen. Robert Boyd from the School-Based uh, Health Alliance uh, is the person who uh, said that. 
In closing, uh, thank you so much to all of you for joining us. We do have one more session next Monday on October 26th at 11, and we'll talk about mental health exercise and leisure activities, howardcenter.org to register or to access resources or any of um, the past sessions recordings, including this one, which will be up within a day or two. So thank you very much. Until then, be well. Okay, if you want to stop sharing, I can try sharing again. I kind of feel like I just want them to figure out a way how we can play on the playground because um, parents are doing the best they can to keep us safe. Um, One thing that definitely helps me is having like like a set space to myself that I can use so I'm not having to like necessarily deal with other people while I'm trying to like be uh, work or especially when I'm in online classes. I definitely think it helps us they uh, nudge students somewhat and give some reminders um, but not be like overbearing where they're on top of you 24-7. They help um, in many different ways to teach us about how we can help ourselves to not get the coronavirus. Uh, I think it's helpful when um, our, when my mom or and dad like write out a schedule for me and then leave it out so I can see it in the morning so I know what we're doing. Um, maybe like one reminder if I need it and um, maybe just making it like easier for me to do my online schoolwork like it's hard to concentrate when you're at home because there's so much you want to do other yeah. than school. Yeah, since the summer, things started to become somewhat normal. I reconnected with my friends, went out to eat lunch on Church Street, but with a mask, of course. Um, like, probably giving your kid a, a bunch of, uh, like a list of things to do because it is very, very, very easy to get sidetracked by Discord and email. Mm -hmm. We were trying to do like I Excel or something. It helps when my parents talk to me and hug me too. And it looks like we still have 50 people here. So I will show the last video. <laughs> I just need to find it quickly. I think these kids talk better than we do, honestly. They're nailing it. So proud of them. Okay, here we go. Last one. I think one thing also that parents shouldn't do is try to like take, um, overly take control of things for their kids. Parents should be stop being stressed because it makes me stressed too. Bye, it became a totally new experience. I weirdly missed walking the halls at school, seeing my teachers and even my friends. I was told I couldn't play lacrosse that year and that I couldn't work. I couldn't go see my friends. I'd have to do some. Reminding me to wear a mask. I know I have to wear a mask. It was already stressful enough to do anything, really. And I get I have to wear a mask. To dismiss uh, the children's like concerns and like things they're scared about. Um, because this is a new thing that no one really has experienced, so people are gonna react differently. Um, I can tell you from personal experience that trying to do science experiments at home is not as easy as it sounds in math too. Um, something I think a parent should never assume is that they know or understand what it's like being a kid right now. So thank you all for coming and for sticking with us through all the technology.